Good morning. And welcome to Braille Institute. Thank you for joining us for our annual macular degeneration and glaucoma seminar and innovation fair. As many of you know, Braille Institute is a nonprofit organization that is dependent upon private donations for support. All of our wonderful programs and services wouldn't be possible without the support of our generous donors and volunteers. Today's seminar is made possible because of a grant from the Mita and George Rosenberg Foundation. This foundation has been generously supporting our annual macular degeneration seminar since 2004. Mita Rosenberg was an Emmy award-winning television producer, story editor, agent, and director whose career spans 65 years. She was diagnosed with macular degeneration in her later years and became a Braille Institute library patron. Asked what words of advice she would give someone else who has lost his senses, her response was truly inspirational. As long as you're alive, she said, you should be living. We're grateful to the Mita and George Rosenberg Foundation and its executive director, Sue Allweiler, who has been one of our most caring donors, regularly attending events in support of Braille Institute. Ms. Allweiler, would you please stand so we could thank you for your continued support. Yeah, We're very happy to have you with us today. We've taken Mita's advice to heart with the creation of our Low Vision Wellness public education campaign, which provides useful tips and information to help people with low vision live their lives to the fullest. We would also like to extend our gratitude to our community partner, Enhance Vision, one of the leading developers of accessible technology for people with low vision, and to the Retina Institute of California, the largest retina group in the Western United States. The Retina Institute's mission is to promote excellence in the care of diseases of the retina, vitreous and macula. At the Retina Institute of California, Doctors utilize the latest modern equipment to help accurately and effectively diagnose retinal conditions and to provide all of the most current treatments, including many available only through research protocols. We would also like to extend our gratitude to both Enhanced Vision and the Retina Institute of California for supporting Braille Institute's efforts to educate and inform the public about living well with low vision and the many ways to stay connected through technology. In doing so, our partner, Enhanced Vision, has generously offered to sponsor a special promotion called Staying Connected with the Pebble. If you haven't had an opportunity to add your name to the drawing for their free handheld Pebble HD magnifier, which is valued at more than $600, we will have forms available for you during intermission. The Pebble small lightweight design makes it a perfect companion for magnification at home or on the go. The winner of the Staying Connected with the Pebble promotion will be drawn at the conclusion of the event today. And remember, you must be present to win. Dr. Michael Davis of the Retina Institute of California completed his undergraduate and medical degrees through an accelerated program at Kent State University and the Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine. He graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree from Kent State University. After earning his medical degree, Dr. Davis completed his internship and his ophthalmology residency at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Davis specializes in the medical and surgical management of many retinal conditions, including diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, dislocated intraocular lenses, macular holes, and retinal detachment. 
He has published several peer-reviewed articles in a wide variety of medical journals and has presented his work at both national and international conferences. He is a member of the Society, American Society of Retinal Specialists, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and many other high-profile professional organizations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Davis. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's see if I get this on. Uh, it's good to be back here. Um, I know I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Um, I just want to say uh, before I start the lecture this morning that for those of you that have seen me lecture before, um, you know my style is very informal. So as we go through, if there's any questions, please feel free to stop me um, and ask your questions as we go along. Um, I would like to ask also that um, I, uh, if, they are, if it's a personal medical question about your personal health, um, I would prefer not to answer it in front of everyone. You can grab me um, uh, in the back after, after my lecture, okay? Um, so this morning I'm going to be talking about age-related macular degeneration. Before we can talk about age-related macular degeneration, we need to learn um, a little bit of the terminology that we use when we describe this disease. Well, the first thing is the retina. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the eye, what is the retina? Well, it's the seeing tissue that li lines the inside of the inside wall of the eye. Now, if you think of the eye like a camera, the front of the eye is like the lens of a camera, and then the back of the eye where the retina is is like the film of the camera. So the retina is analogous to the film in the camera. It's the actual area where uh, the light hits and converts it into a signal, which then can be interpreted by your brain so that you can see uh, uh, what your eye is seeing. Now, when we talk about macular degeneration, the macula isn't a specific organ in the eye. It's actually a region of the retina. It's the very center part of the retina where fine and detailed vision occur. And that's where this disease, age-related macular degeneration, affects. There's many other diseases that affect the same area um, of the retina as well. So what is age-related macular degeneration? Well, it's a degenerative disease that affects the macula, which can lead to central vision loss and blindness. Now, there are other forms of macular degeneration, um, but this morning we're only going to be talking about the age-related form of macular degeneration. It is the leading cause of blindness for patients in the United States over the age of 50. So it's a very severe um, and uh, important problem in our society. So who gets macular degeneration? What are the risk factors? Well, as the name applies, as you get older, you're at a higher risk for developing it. It's called age-related macular degeneration for a reason, because it's more common as you get older. Generally, the patients are over 50 years old, and once you reach 80 years old, that's when the risk really increases. It's more common in females, about two to one times chance of developing macular degeneration if you're a female versus men. And it's also more common and less pigmented. So Caucasians have the highest risk of developing macular degeneration. Now, if you look at this graph here, this shows the prevalence by age. It's about 50 years to the left of this graph. And by the time you get up here, this is greater than 80. So you can see there's a large increase in the cases of macular degeneration as the population ages. This graph here to the right is showing men versus women. As you can see, it's about 2 to 1. The green is the women, and the yellow is the men. So about 2 to 1 uh, women to men. But what are some other risk factors? Well, cigarette smoking. This is one of the biggest preventable risk factors for macular degeneration. Um, you can't do much about getting older, but you can certainly do a lot about smoking. So that's the number one thing I tell my patients when they have any signs of macular degeneration, or even if they don't have signs of macular degeneration, is to stop smoking. Uh, patients who smoke have a seven times increased risk of developing severe vision loss from their macular degeneration if they don't stop smoking. 
And blood pressure, high blood pressure has also been seen as a risk factor for developing macular degeneration. So my patients with macular degeneration, I make sure that they get their blood pressure checked and make sure they stay on their medications that their doctor recommends them to take. Other risk factors, it's thought that years and years of UV exposure or sunlight exposure lead to macular degeneration. Basically, sunlight does a lot of damage to both the skin, but it can also do damage to the eyes, and it creates um, you know, different uh, uh, chemicals that can cause damage to the retina, which then lead to development of macular degeneration. So in patients, I always recommend that they wear sunglasses, um, especially younger patients with a family history of macular degeneration, to try to prevent their overall exposure to these UV radiation light from the sun. There's also dietary factors. So high-fat diets are associated with a greater risk of uh, macular degeneration, as well as high cholesterol diets and obesity. Um, so I always tell my patients to try to eat more healthy, try to lose weight, and that will decrease their risk of developing more severe macular degeneration. There's also protective nutrients. Um, there's high levels of zinc can be protective, vitamin E, beta carotene, and other forms of vitamins like uh, beta carotene, like lutein and zeaxanthine. And we'll go into that a little bit more in detail when I talk about treatment and prevention of macular degeneration. It's also uh, inherited. There's a lot of genetics behind macular degeneration. We know that if you have a first degree relative with macular degeneration, you have a four times risk of developing severe macular degeneration versus the general population. And that's what's being shown on this graph here. The blue is the general population. So by the age of 80, the general population has about a 10% risk of developing macular degeneration. And if you have a first degree relative, that's about 40%. So four times the risk if you have a family member with macular degeneration. And I think, was there a question in the back? Yeah, I have two questions. Okay. they can develop macular degeneration. Um, and oftentimes, patients who are born early, and what the gentleman is asking about is premature babies, when they're born, their retina hasn't fully developed. So they can de develop problems in their retina from being born premature. Um, and that in itself can lead to loss of vision. Sometimes those patients, though, even if they don't have severe loss of vision as a child, their eyes tend to be more nearsighted as they grow up. And those patients more often will develop what's called myopic macular degeneration or macular degeneration because they're so nearsighted. Um, so they can develop a severe form of macular degeneration. Generally, it's not um, technically the age-related form, though. Uh, myopic macular degeneration. And myopic just means nearsighted. You're welcome. Now we do have, I was talking about genetics and macular degeneration. There are some commercial tests that we sometimes will use for patients to determine their risk of developing more severe forms of macular degeneration. Um, and it's a swab that we can do in the office and we send it to the company and they analyze their genetics for specific genes that can then, um, that are known to be high risk for developing macular degeneration. And then we can give the patient um, some guidance as to whether they should you know, modify their diet, um, be more vigilant about losing weight, or um, stop smoking, although I would always recommend that they stop smoking. Yes. What about artificial ret Ooh. <laughs> I hear myself. What about artificial uh, retinas? Have they developed anything with artificial retinas yet? And glaucoma, um, is there any way that they have to, um, to uh, clear glaucoma other than operations and stuff like that? I don't trust operations. Um, we are talking to a surgeon, so... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, but you, but you're talking to a man who has one <laughs> blind eye and one eye with glaucoma. No, I know. And um, you know, uh, you, if you got one blind eye and one eye that that sees fairly decently, um, you don't you don't want to uh, uh, trust that fairly decent eye to a surgeon. <laughs> right. No, I understand why you'd be hesitant. Yeah. Um, on your question about artificial retinas, um, there is some development in that field. It's mainly for, at this point, uh, being used for patients with retinitis pigmentosa that have severe complete vision loss. Now, when we talk about macular degeneration, this is mainly central vision loss that these patients are experiencing. So they still maintain their peripheral vision um, with macular degeneration. Um, so the artificial retina program is not being used as much for for macular degeneration. I will talk a little bit more about some things we're doing at the Retina Institute for macular degeneration. We are involved with some stem cell research to try to get the retina to regenerate. Um, and there's also some other medications that we're using to either inject into the eye or inject into your blood to stop the progression of the macular degeneration. But a lot of those are still in the experimental phase at this point. Oh, well, do you have experimental programs for that? We do, might be yes. Able to get in? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll need to see you later. Then. And then for your question for glaucoma, my associate, Dr. Bachman, the next lecture is actually all about glaucoma. Mm -hmm. So uh, best if you hold your question for Dr. Bachman when she comes to give her lecture, and she'd be happy to answer your question. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, hold on, hold on one second. We have somebody over in this. Okay. Hello, my name is Robert B. Walker. My father went blind at 80 years old. So now I'm going blind at 80. I have a glaucoma. Any way you can fix it? <laughs> well, the, he had asked, he, he says that he has glaucoma and is losing vision yeah, and my wants father, to know. My father went blind. Your, his father went blind yeah. and, he's, and you're losing vision now because right. of glaucoma. Um, so there's a lot of treatments for glaucoma, which Dr. Bachman will be speaking about in the next lecture okay. um, as far as drops and different surgeries and things. So Thanks much. You're welcome. And there's a okay. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, what are the symptoms of uh, macular degeneration? <laughs> what are the symptoms? So initially there aren't many symptoms, but once it starts to develop, um, basically... You can have either blurred vision yes. or waviness in your vision where straight lines look uh, distorted or are missing uh, areas. Okay. But it does not have any pain or anything like that. So it's not a painful disease. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, this is, this is Barbara Ryder speaking. And... Uh, <coughs> Yes, what I, what I wanted to know is the way they talk about high blood pressure and they say, well, it's the silent killer and watch out. Is macular degeneration something like this that you, you can see, but there's some little problems that, gee, I didn't know I had this, et cetera? Right. Often, in, in most patients, they don't have any <laughs> symptoms when they first develop the macular degeneration, which is why we monitor patients very closely because often we can see progression of it or if it, and we'll go into the different types of uh, macular degeneration, but sometimes we can see where it's starting to develop a problem where we need to do treatment before the patient even has symptoms. So it, that's why it's once we d diagnose somebody with macular degeneration, that's why we follow them every few months to watch for any changes um, because often we can detect changes before it starts to affect their vision. We'll do one more question, then I'll go through a couple more slides, okay? Yeah, I have a question. Um, more later on, you guys can talk about the red eyes pictosa. Retina, yeah. No, I won't, the, to, this morning I won't be talking about retina uh, pigmentosa. And who will talk about that? Uh, I don't think anybody's ta giving a lecture today about retina uh, pigmentosa. Yeah, you, I have a bunch of questions like... Hmm. I don't really know about it that much, and that's why I want to find out more information about it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so how many people in the, in the country have macular degeneration? Well, it's estimated that the early stages of macular degeneration 
is about seven and a half million people in the United States. So it's a, a lot of people who have early signs of macular degeneration. And these would be the patients that I talked about that would have no symptoms and may not even know that they have signs of macular degeneration in the eyes unless their doctor tells them that they do. Now about three and a half million people have what we call high risk macular degeneration. These patients may have mild symptoms from the macular degeneration, but not severe symptoms. Um, but again, these are patients that are at higher risk for then going on to develop more severe macular degeneration. And then patients with severe macular degeneration, these are usually patients with so at least some vision loss or some vision uh, problems from it, is about one million for what we call the dry form of macular degeneration. And I'll go over in a minute the dry versus the wet and then about one and a half million with wet, um, so about two, two and a half million people with severe vision loss from macular degeneration in the United States. And that number is increasing. If you look at the year 2000, it was about 1.75 million, and it's estimated that by the year 2020, uh, it's about almost three million. So it's almost a 50 to 60% increase in the incidence of macular degeneration. And the main reason for this is that the population, patients are living longer. And you have the baby boomer generation that's now coming into the age where they're developing macular degeneration as well. So when we talk about macular degeneration, you may hear two terms or two types of macular degeneration. So we classify macular degeneration as either being dry or wet. Now, they aren't two separate diseases. But what they are is basically a continuum of the same disease. So most often, patients start with the dry form of macular degeneration, and then some of those patients then go on to develop the wet form of macular degeneration. So the dry form is the most common. So patients who are early stage, who don't have many symptoms, will have the dry form. And it's about 10% of the population over the age of 50 or 55 will have early signs of macular degeneration of the dry type. Now the wet type is the more severe type and usually presents with severe sudden vision loss in patients. Now about 10%, so one out of 10 patients with the dry form of macular degeneration will then go on to develop the wet form of macular degeneration. There's certain things that we see on exam that can give us a clue as to who's at home. With dry macular degeneration, I mentioned that this is usually the less severe form, but these patients, even if they don't convert to the wet form, the more severe form, they can still have vision loss. And the way that they develop vision loss is after years and years of having these age spots, they can start to have a wearing away of the retina and they can develop what's called atrophy or a loss of the retina where they get these atrophic areas where the retina can no longer function or see. When they develop a severe loss of this, it's what we call geographic atrophy. And this is when the whole center part of the retina is basically worn away. And now they have severe central vision loss from macular degeneration. And the way I explain this to patients, it's almost if you have this carpet here and you walk up and down the middle of the carpet going through a crack in the sidewalk. So you have a crack in your sidewalk, which is the weak area in the retina. And over time, these abnormal blood vessels find their way through that crack and cause basically a weed to grow under the retina. So why do we differentiate between the wet form and the dry form? Well, the first reason why it's important for a prognosis. In general, patients with the dry form of macular degeneration have a better prognosis. And although they can develop vision loss from the macular degeneration, it's, a very, it's usually a very slow process. So gradually, over years and years, they would develop central vision loss. Whereas a patient with wet macular degeneration, the prognosis is poorer, and they usually develop more sudden vision loss. It's also important for treatment. Yes, sir, in the back. Is there any treatment there is, and I'll go that over that in just a minute. That can be given to prolong the loss. Uh, there is, and I'll go over that in just a minute in a couple slides, okay? Thank you. Um, so it is important for treatment, and just as the gentleman in the back asked, is that for the wet form of macular degeneration, we do have very effective treatments. For the dry form, we don't have very effective treatments. For the dry form, we recommend um, basically lifestyle and dietary changes, which we'll go over in a minute. 
And as I mentioned earlier, for more severe forms of the dry form of macular degeneration, we are involved with some studies to try to develop some treatment for this, because at this point, there is no known treatment. So how do we as retina specialists diagnose macular degeneration? Well, when you come to our office, oftentimes you'll be referred by either your optometrist or your general ophthalmologist, or you may come in on your own if you notice that you have loss of vision. And what we do in our office is we'll check your vision, oops. we check the eye pressure, and then we'll dilate the eyes. So we put those drops in that everybody loves, that open the pupil and make you very sensitive to light. <laughs> but but that's the only way that we can see into the back of the eye is by dilating the eyes. So unfortunately, we have to do it. But if you can invent a way for us to examine your eyes without dilating them, you'll be a billionaire. <laughs> and the most popular patient. <laughs> and then after we dilate your eyes, we'll do a complete exam, which involves looking with a lot of bright lights, which everybody likes as well. And oftentimes... And oftentimes, just from that, we can tell whether you have macular degeneration and whether it's the wet form or the dry form. But oftentimes, it's difficult to tell, and we have to do some special testing. One of the tests we do is called an optical coherence tomography, or OCT for short. And this is basically a scan of the retina. And it, it's almost like a CAT scan in some sense, but it doesn't have any radiation like a CAT scan does. But it takes a cross-section picture of the retina so we can see the detail and see if there's any fluid or blood or anything within the retina. We'll often take pictures so that we can either you know, help us to determine what you have or to help follow the progression of the disease. And then another test that everyone likes when they come into our office is called a fluorescein angiogram. And for this test, um, it's a special test that, you know, generally only retina specialists do this test, but what we do is we inject a dye called fluorescein into a vein, either in your arm or your hand, and then take a series of pictures of the back of the eye to look at the circulation. Now, we do this test for both macular degeneration and for a lot of other diseases. So if you go to your doctor and he does this test, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have macular degeneration. And then it takes high-resolution pictures of the back of the eye of the retina, and it also, we take a video so we can see this in real-time motion um, when we see it played back. And this is really the best way of determining whether you have dry or wet macular degeneration. This is an example of the OCT test that I talked about. And what it does is it takes a cross-section picture of the retina. So this is actually somebody's retina. This little dimple here is the very center of vision. This OCT is fairly normal, mm -hmm. although there are some little bumps under the retina here, and these are actually the drusen, or those age spots that I talked about. Normally, it should be flat like this, but this patient has a few little bumps under the retina, and those are the age spots. Now, this patient has more severe changes. This patient actually has fluid within the retina, which are these big black areas here. There's fluid underneath the retina as well. So this patient has the wet form of macular degeneration, and we can tell that just from their OCT scan. So your doctor tells you have macular degeneration. Now what? Well, as I mentioned, for a dry macular degeneration, we don't really have a good effective treatment. So you, it's basically modifying lifestyle. So the first thing that I tell all patients, and I tell all my patients this whether they have macular degeneration or not, but stop smoking. Smoking is very, very bad for you, both for your eyes and for your overall health. And then I talk to them about dietary modifications. So I tell them to eat a lot of healthy things like green leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, all those yummy things, fish. Um, and then if they do have more severe signs of the dry macular degeneration, there are some special vitamins that uh, patients can take. And those are called the ARIDS vitamins or the A-R-E-D-S vitamins. And those were developed by a big study done by the National Eye Institute called the uh, Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And basically, these have high doses of vitamin C, E, zinc, copper, lutein, zeaxanthine, and omega-3. And the other thing that I tell patients with the dry form of macular degeneration, it's very important for them to monitor their vision at home because I can't see them every day. Um, and so we give them what's called an Amsler grid. And that's what this is here. It looks basically like a piece of graph paper with a dot in the middle. And I tell them to check each eye individually so they cover one eye and look at the dot. And they want to make sure all the lines are straight. 
Now, your doctor may give you one of these for other diseases because, as I mentioned, the area of the retina that the macular degeneration affects also is affected by other diseases. So just because your doctor gives you this graft doesn't necessarily mean you have macular degeneration. But this is one of the tools that we use so that you can monitor your vision at home. And this is an example of what it might look like if a patient started to develop problems from macular degeneration. They can get a dark area with some wiggly or distorted lines. And if that happens, I tell them to call the office and get in to be seen within a day or two. Now, the gentleman in the back asks, well, what happens if you have wet macular degeneration? What do we do? So, well, first I give the same recommendations as for dry macular degeneration. Stop smoking, and then we'll put them on uh, the vitamins and tell them to modify their lifestyle. But we also have some good medications that have been developed recently in the last several years to treat the wet form of macular degeneration. There's three basic medications we use, and depending on you, know, you and your doctor's discussion, they'll determine which of those to use. And it is a monthly injection into the eye usually until the, macular, until the leaking or bleeding stops, but oftentimes patients may need these injections for the duration of their life um, to maintain good vision. Does the shot hurt? It does not hurt. So you would think sticking a needle in the eye hurts, but we give you a lot of numbing medication to make it as pleasant as it can be. Uh, we don't knock you out, but we do, uh, uh, it's done in the office, so it's not done. Because it's monthly, you know, you don't go to an operating room or to a surgery for it. It's actually done in our office under a local, basically just eye drops and a little numbing injection and then an injection into the eye. And most patients say that they don't even know that I've done it at the time. Now, after the shot, the eye may burn a little bit, um, but for the most part, by the next day, the eye goes back to feeling normal. Um, and as I mentioned before, it is a chronic disease. So macular degeneration, both the wet and dry form, are chronic, and patients need close and frequent follow-up for both of these diseases. Question. I have, yes, I have a question. You're mentioning an injection, but I've also heard that laser is used to treat this. And uh, how is this done and when? So in today's day, we don't use laser very often for macular degeneration. In the past, we used to use laser because we had no other treatment. And all the studies done on laser basically showed that patients who, didn't have the, who had the laser still had severe vision loss, but the loss was less than it would have been if they didn't have the laser. And in fact, they usually lost vision right away, and then it maintained itself. So it was a pretty tough sell to patients to say, you know, I'm going to do this treatment, your vision is going to get worse by tomorrow, but four years from now, you're going to see better than you would have if I didn't do the laser. So as you can imagine, there wasn't a big lineup for the laser treatment for this. Um, now, there are some instances where the laser still may be used, especially if the leakage is not right in the center of vision. Sometimes the laser will be used. There's also another type of laser that's sometimes called a cold laser, and this is a type of laser where we inject a medicine in the vein, and then it's activated by infrared light. And again, this is something that um, was more popular before we had the injections, but is very rarely used now. Yes. Viral, no, it's not. She asked if there were if viral macular degeneration. There's certain viruses that can cause changes in the macula of the retina, which is the same area that mac the age-related macular degeneration affects. Uh, but they're not related. But a patient could have both at the same time as well. You know, if a patient at one point had developed a type of viral macular degeneration, you know, they could still go on to develop age-related macular degeneration as well. Huh? Yes. Yes. Would it have side effects with other medications that you're taking? Not generally, because most of the medicine stays within the eye. Okay. I missed that conversation. I didn't know if it was a question. She asked if the medicines that we inject into the eye will have any um, interaction with other medications the patient may be taking. 
And I said, in general, no, because most of the medicine stays right in the eye. It stays very local inside of the eye for the most part. Now, if you're on a blood thinner like Coumadin or Plavix, oftentimes after the injection, the eye will turn very, very red, which looks really scary, but it doesn't do any harm to the eye. But that would be the one thing with the injections that, you know, if you're on a systemic medication like aspirin or Plavix, Coumadin, Warfarin, something that thins the blood, you'd be more likely to develop a very red eye right after the shot. So we have one question here. At what age does age-related macular degeneration start? Uh, generally the age of 50. Oh, it's over here. Um, usually before the age of 50, we don't classify it as age-related. After the age of 50, we classify it as age-related. It's very, very rare for patients under the age of 50 to develop age-related macular degeneration. Generally, if they do, it's um, usually a form of an inherited macular degeneration, not necessarily age-related. We have another question here. Okay. How much of the vitamin should you take? Uh, read the instructions on the bottle, because it varies depending on which brand you get. Some of them are four vitamins a day. Some are two a day. Um, so there's several different companies. There's PreserVision, Occuvite, uh, Macular Health Formula, um, and several others. But the important thing to look at on the bottle is to make sure, um, and remember, only take these if your doctor has told you you have macular degeneration and you should take them, um, because they do have high doses of vitamins, and you don't want to just be taking them thinking that's going to prevent it, because there's no evidence that it prevents it unless you have signs of macular degeneration already. Um, but the important thing to look on the bottle is the AREDS or the AREDS because um, that will have the, uh, the right dosages of the vitamins based on the study. Question here? Question? I can turn. Okay. Dr. Davis. Yes. Can you please educate me a little bit about the injection the in, uh, inject into the eye? Now, can you please explain to me do you want How me to, effective? Do you, maybe there's a volunteer we can demonstrate. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, <laughs> you just need to explain for me, sir. I, well, I actually have a How? video of it, but I thought that might be too much okay. for this early in the morning. No, so. I just wanted to know. You know, I've had that procedure done. Right. And so generally, what, what I do in my office is we, the, uh, we'll put some eye drops in the eye that numb the eye first. <laughs> and then I usually give a little shot of medicine to further numb the eye um, just under the white part of the eye. Um, and then that numbs the eye. And then we put what's called a lid speculum, where it's almost like a metal clamp that keeps the eye open. And then um, the needle actually goes through the white part of the eye, just behind the colored part of the eye. Um, and, that, and then we inject the medicine there. Yes, but what I'm, my question to you is this. I understand from you explaining that they stopped using that procedure. That we stopped using it? Yeah, they don't use it. No, time. no, no. The laser we don't use very oh, much. Oh, the laser? The injections, we still do a lot of injections. Oh, you do the injections? Yeah, in yeah the we head. still do a lot of the injections. That's the best treatment that we have right now for the macular degeneration. Okay, is it yeah. effective, sir? It is very many, effective. Okay, because when I had that procedure, it wasn't successful for me. And they indicated that I fall within 2%. Yeah, you fall in a very small percent. So about 95 to 98% of people who get the injections yes, will at least maintain the vision that they have. About 30 to 40% will actually get an improvement in vision. And so less than about 5 to 2%, 2 to 5% will actually continue to have vision loss despite getting the injections. Okay, well, the so it's a very low percentage that still have vision loss even with the shots. Well, me, it, it, it took my sight away, and I never had that sight in that eyes no more. It took it away. <laughs> so that's the reason why I ask. You okay. know, the little sight I had was gone. We have another question right. over okay. here. Um, my question was... Can macular degeneration be inherited? Like, say, for example, if uh, one, say, a, if a female was born with it, could can his can her uh, child um, possibly become born with the same condition as well? Um, so there are some inherited forms of macular degeneration that you know that could happen with. 
with the age-related type that we're talking about today, um, it's not really a direct inheritance, but you, they, the daughter or son would be at a higher risk, a four times risk than the general population of developing it later in their life. Yes. Thank you, doctor. Could you possibly tell us, going back to the retina, could you possibly tell us what are the developments as far as the stem cell is concerned or the treatments for uh, uh, geographic atrophy or the new thing they call nano-retina? So, Thank you for your time. So what we're doing at the Retina Institute, we're actually involved with a study with Johnson & Johnson where we're using stem cells, and we implant these stem cells under the retina near the geographic atrophy to try to regenerate that retina that's lost. Um, and right now, we're about to start the phase two trial. So it's still very early um, in the trial, but there has been some success. So it is very promising. Um, I'm not as familiar with the nano retina that you're, that you're t speaking of, though. Um, but I am familiar with the stem cells. We have another Thank question over here. Yeah, does uh, macular degeneration affect certain races and cultures more so than others? It does. So it's more prevalent in uh, races and cultures that are more lightly pigmented. So Caucasians are at the highest risk. So Scandinavian, um, anybody with fair skin is a higher risk. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Here, so there's a question up here, too, if you want to. What causes the yellow to build up in the eye? It's basically, um, so the retina, when it sees light, there are certain parts of the retina that are given off as waste product. When you're young, the tissue underneath the retina can clear that waste product away. As you get older, that tissue under the retina becomes less effective, and you basically get buildup of waste product under the retina. So what do you do to get rid of it? There's, anyway. You can't get rid of it. Because I have a nice, my eyes are yellow now. Right. So they're... Um, you know, changing your diet will help prevent it from getting worse, but there's really nothing to get rid of those age spots under the retina. Thank you. We have another question over here. Uh, yes, uh, you said uh, quite a while ago there were three different types of injections or medications. What are they and why would one be used over another, please? So there's three different names of the medicines. One is called Avastin. One is called Lucentis, and the other is called Ilea. Uh, Avastin and Lucentis are very similar um, in the way that they work. And there was actually a big study done by the National Eye Institute to compare the two, and it found that the two were uh, pretty equal in efficacy. Um, the Lucentis is the one that's FDA approved for use in the eye. Avastin, we use what's called off-label. Um, for the eye, but it was actually the first one that we used. And then they then took that Avastin and modified it and changed it basically into Lucentis and marketed it. The other difference between the two is the Avastin is about $50 to $75 a dose. Lucentis is about $2,000 a dose. So it's much, much more expensive. Um, in general, in my practice, I generally start with Avastin as my first line of treatment for this disease. And most patients do very well being treated with Avastin. The ILEA is the newest of the three medications, and it works in a little bit of a different way than the Avastin and the Lucentis. And generally, what I do is if the patient is not responding as well to the Avastin, I then change them over to ILEA um, at that point. Um, ILEA is also very expensive, though. Uh, it's also about $2,000 a dose. Question? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Is it possible in one family, the sister to develop retinitis pigmentosa and was able to work and see to walk on the street, while the brother at the age of 45, he wasn't able to read or write, but he is still at the age 67, he could see in the dark and he could see any time, but he cannot read or write. Is that macular degeneration? But the older sister, she has uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, so generally, retinitis pigmentosa usually affects the peripheral and night vision first. Exactly. 
So from what you're telling me, it doesn't sound like the brother has retinitis pigmentosa. He may have macular degeneration because but it's more of his But he can see even in the dark, and he can help me sometimes to walk, you know? Right. Not sometimes, all the time. Right. It sounds like his problem may be different than her problem. But it's really hard to tell based on symptoms because oftentimes even patients with macular degeneration or retinitis pigmentosa will have varying degrees of the disease. So just like people can have mild macular degeneration and some people can have severe macular degeneration, mm. some people may have more mild forms of retinitis pigmentosa and some people may have more severe forms of it, even if they're in the same family. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that brother, he is still working and he can see in the dark even, but he cannot read. <laughs> right. Right, which is why, you know, usually retinitis pigmentosa affects night vision as one of the first signs. So my suspicion is he may not have retinitis pigmentosa. He may have a different problem. One more question. Oh, uh, I would like to say um, I had that uh, injection. Uh, I had my last one in November. Uh -huh. And it really worked beautifully. Good. Yes, I mean, a lot of patients, especially if you catch it early, will have a great response to it, which is, which is really good because in the past, before 2005 or 2006, we didn't really have good effective treatment for the wet form. And it wasn't painful, you guys, either. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, she had an injection in her eye in November, and she said that she had a really good response to the shots. Yeah, I had my five or six all doing prior to that, but the last one was in November. So now when I went back, the, everything has gotten better. I was When I first started, I couldn't see anything. And then now I can see. Right. My vision went to 2060, so that's good, good. compared to nothing. And the other thing to keep in mind, we also do those injections for other diseases too, like diabetes or blocked blood vessels. Um, so it's important to also talk to your doctor when they say, you know, they're recommending a shot in the eye to ask them, you know, to make sure you understand why you're getting the shot, too. Um, because we do use the same medications for different diseases as well. Yes. So it's a uh, it's they're not embryonic stem cells. They're um, mesenchymal stem cells. Um, so they actually use uh, it's from the umbilical cord. There is, oh, yes, there is uh, some controversy before about human stem cells. So now really? what I didn't is the hear. source of the stem cells that you're so, using for the... Yeah, no, they're not embryonic system. stem cells. Um, it's a stem cell line that was developed by Johnson & Johnson. Um, and so that's where we, we, you know, we partnered with Johnson & Johnson. Good. There's two sites in the country, um, us and Will's, Hos Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia are the two sites for, the, for this we trial. Embry embryonic stem cells. Uh, no, they are not embryonic stem cells. The one they're, that you use? They're from the umbilical cord. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, if macular degeneration starts at age 50, what is it under the age of 50? So we would still call it macular degeneration if you have signs of macular degeneration, mm -hmm. but it may not necessarily be the age age-related form of macular degeneration. Okay. Can you tell me what the difference between macular degeneration and star guards is? So star guards um, is a form of macular degeneration, right. but it's not related to aging. It's actually inherited. Um, and it usually, vision loss does happen later in life, but it has other signs that are different than age-related macular degeneration. Okay. But it can affect your vision under the age of 50. And so that's one of, when patients present with vision, uh, vision changes under the age of 50, that's one of the things that we look for is star guards. Hi, I'd like to know about the um, injections that you give. Um, are there, is the medicine all brand name medication? Uh, no, so the, um, uh, the Avastin, I mean, we do buy it all as brand name, but they have other names too. So Avastin is called Bevacizumab. Um, so it's generic? It's, it's not generic, but um, so the way the Avacin works is um, since it's, it was a, developed first as a cancer drug, um, so the dose that they give for cancer patients is much higher than what we would inject into the eye. It's about, you basically take the cancer drug and divide it into 400 doses. So the, 
the medicine bottle itself would be very expensive, but then the compounding pharmacy then divides it into about 400 doses. So that's why each individual dose, when we give it for the eye, is much less expensive than the other medications. Okay, thank you. Another question here. Uh, doctor, good morning. Uh, my question is, last time I visited my doctor, ophthalmologist, he was telling me that my vision cannot improve because my optical nerves have been damaged. And my question now is, are you developing anything that could bypass the optical nerve and transmit it straight to the brain so that we can still get our vision back? Yeah, that's a tough question because the, um, for those of you who don't know, the optic nerve is actually the cable that takes the signal from the retina to the brain. Um, so there is a lot of research in that area, but nothing that I know of right now um, that's, you know, near on the horizon to, to bypass the optic nerve. One more question. So does uh, macular degeneration have anything to do with cancer? It does not have anything to do with cancer, no. Uh, so we actually have 25 locations. Um, we have a table in the room over here to the left. Christina is there with some brochures that give all the office locations. So depending on where you live would depend on, um, but we have locations all over California. Okay, thank you. One more? Uh, next, oh. Do you want to move on? Yes. One more. One more question. We'll do one more question. I'm yeah. actually done with it because this I already talked about. Uh, so. With the... With the stem cell study, is there a hope for retinitis pigmentosa? Because my daughter, she is following up with some side in uh, uh, not Orange County, in uh, Irvine Center regarding retinitis pigmentosa, I mean, with the stem cell. So I know that uh, at... I believe at Jules Stein, they, they did do some stem cell work with retinitis pigmentosa. Our specific study is only looking at um, advanced dry macular degeneration. Now, does that mean that once we determine if this is a viable treatment for that, could we then, you know, then apply it to other diseases potentially? But this, at this time, um, our study is not involved with retinitis pigmentosa. Okay. Well, I thank everybody for their attention. So a very, very big thank you to Dr. Davis. I love to hear him speak because he speaks so clearly. And he explains things so well. OK, I want to thank someone else. And that would be Mark Gredget, who has provided all the wonderful refreshments today. So please give him a very big hand. OK, and now we're going to take a 10-minute break. In that time, you, if you have not registered for the pebble drawing, you can do that in the lobby. Okay, and please come back in 10 minutes and we'll have our second speaker. In Little Rock, and she is now one of the top retina specialists in Westchester. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jessica Bachman. Hello, thanks for having me today. I'm glad to be here. Um, today I'll be giving a talk about glaucoma, the screening, treatment, and diagnosis. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. But if we could hold personal questions to the end and you come up and ask me individually, I think that would be best. So here we go. So glaucoma is a group of disorders that's characterized by damage to the optic nerve. This damage to the optic nerve causes irreversible vision loss. It's often associated with elevated pressure in the eye, which is also called elevated interocular pressure. This elevated pressure in the eye um, causes loss of nerve fibers that can compose the optic nerve. So there are several different types of glaucoma. These types include congenital glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, angle closure glaucoma, 
a normal tension glaucoma, and secondary glaucoma. About 90% of the glaucoma in the United States is primary open angle glaucoma, or POAG for short. So just a review um, on eye anatomy. This is the front of the eye. That's called the cornea. And light enters the eye through the cornea, travels through the pupil, which is the black opening in the eye, and then hits the back part of the eye called the because the symptoms of primary, most patients who have primary open angle glaucoma are asymptomatic, which means they don't know they have the disease until it's detected by their eye care doctor or until they have permanent visual loss. So you may or may not have elevated pressure on your eye exam. And as I said earlier, glaucoma causes gradual loss of peripheral vision. Most patients don't notice that they're losing their peripheral vision until it starts to affect the center of the vision. And glaucoma doesn't affect the central part of your vision until late in the course of the disease. And unfortunately, um, glaucoma is one disease that cause, can cause permanent and total blindness, whereas macular degeneration, which Dr. Davis just talked about, it only tends to involve the center and you keep the peripheral vision. So... When you go see your eye doctor, your eye doctor looks for a few things on exam to determine whether or not you may or may not have glaucoma. The first thing they do is check your interocular pressure, or IOP. As I mentioned earlier, high pressure in your eye can be associated with glaucoma, but not always. They also, and I'll go over each one of these more uh, in depth on the next slides, but they might also know, notice what's called increased cupping of the optic nerve. And then we'll do visual field screenings on you, and those can cause a progressive characteristic visual field loss. Also, if any of you have glaucoma, they also often do a scan of your optic nerves to measure the thickness of the optic nerves. And this is called um, an ocular coherence topography or an OCT of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So, as I mentioned earlier, increased pressure in your eye may or may not be associated with glaucoma. Normal pressure um, in a population is less than or equal to 21. But just because you have a high pressure in your eye doesn't mean that you necessarily have glaucoma because some patients will naturally have high pressure in their eye. And IOP, the pressure in the eye, is skewed towards higher measurements. And as I mentioned earlier, some patients may have thick corneas, and that can artificially cause an elevated pressure in the eye. So this picture just shows what's called increased cupping of the optic nerve. So the photo on your left right here shows a normal optic nerve with a normal cup to disc ratio. However, in a glaucomatous nerve or in patients who have glaucoma, this cup to disc ratio is increased. So here is the optic disc. So that's the disc. And here's the cup. See how this cup is a lot larger than this cup. And that means that there have been loss of the nerve fibers that transmit signal, visual signals back to the brain. Here's another just uh, cartoon illustration to help demonstrate this. Here's a normal optic nerve again, and here's a glaucomatous optic nerve with loss of the um, nerve fiber layer. So there are several different types of glaucoma tests, as I mentioned earlier. The, next, the first one is the pressure checking test. Then we have what's called gonioscopy, which looks at the trabecular meshwork or the drainage um, structure of the eye. We also have visual field testing and um, OCT retinal nerve fiber layer. So the first thing we do when you come to the doctor's office, many of you have, are familiar with the old air puff way of measuring pressure. That way has largely been replaced by actual direct contact methods. And what I mean is we actually put something up against the eye to check the pressure itself. Um, this is called a tonopin. It's a good screening test for um, all patients when they come to the eye doctor just to get a, a quick measurement of what their pressure is. However, the gold standard or the more accurate way of checking pressure is by actually putting a Goldman um, applination tip up against the cornea of the eye and indenting it slightly to get a good reading. Um, for those of you who have trouble seeing it, this patient, this is the patient's eye and this is the slit lamp. 
and this is directly touching the eyeball itself to obtain a pressure measurement. Yes. The question was, does that uh, applinator tip hurt your eyeball? And the answer is no. A lot of patients are scared because there's something coming directly at their eye that will touch the eye. But the drop we put in prior to measuring the eye pressure numbs the eyeball itself, so you won't be able to feel it. Yes. The question was, can you use that same measurement if you have an implant in the eye? And the answer to that is yes. So uh, that's with the, 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 the interocular lens, or you've had cataract surgery, right? Yes. You can use the same way to measure it, pressure. Okay, the next text we do is to look at the angle of the eye, which is the drainage structure of the eye. We, the exam technique is called gonioscopy. And this determines whether or not you have open angle or angle closure glaucoma. As I mentioned earlier, 90% of the glaucoma in the U.S. is open angle, but we always want to verify that by using this exam. So here's just a cartoon illustration of what we look for. You can't see the angle on the open eye because of eye optics, so we have to put this special mirror, as I showed you right here earlier, on the eyeball itself to view this angle. So open angle means the iris, oops, the iris is flat and not occluding this angle. In angle closure, the iris tends to have more of a bowed position, and it actually obstructs the angle and prevents fluid outflow from occurring. Um, as many of you know, visual field testing is a very important part of glaucoma, both in screening and in progression and uh, monitoring the stability of the disease. And it's an objective way for the physician to make sure that your glaucoma is not getting worse because as I mentioned earlier, most patients don't know that they have glaucoma until end stages of disease or until they've lost a significant amount of vision. So over here on the left is what's called a Humphrey visual field tester. So to do this exam, they put a patch over one eye and have you focus on a light straight ahead. The machine then displays lights in your peripheral vision, and you press a button on the machine every time you see a light. Yeah, and it's some, sometimes it's a hard test to take, and there's a little bit of a learning curve. So the first time you take that test, it might not be very good. tell if your cataract is growing? So, yes, sometimes patients with cataracts have a hard time taking this test because the, the question was, can this test be used to monitor cataracts? And it can't necessarily be used to monitor cataracts, but when your cataracts are really bad, you can't take the test as well because the light doesn't get through the cataract as well. So that's a good question. Yeah, I that one and yeah, sometimes it's really fifth. hard to take. There's a big learning curve. It's tough. Yeah. So the image over here on the right shows um, a patient's uh, visual field test. The black areas are areas which the patient can't see, and the white areas are where the patient can see. So this uh, visual field test is consistent with damage caused by glaucoma. As you can see, the central part of the vision remains but all around the outside, in the black areas, the patient can't see these areas. Um, the next text we use to look for glaucoma or monitor progression of the disease is called OCT uh, RNFL, or ocular coherence tom tomography of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And this is a scan used to measure how thick the optic nerve is. Um, patients with glaucomas have thin optic nerves. And that is, if you remember the first pictures I showed you at the beginning um, of how, what a normal optic nerve looks like and what a glaucomatous optic nerve looks like, that loss of tissue or that increased cupping is what causes that thinning. So here's a picture of an OCT. Um, everything in green is normal, but everything in red and yellow is abnormal. So as you can see, this patient 
has lost thickness of their optic nerve because of their glaucoma. And we can tell that because the scan shows us this red area and this yellow area. When it gets really severe, it will be all red and yellow, which worries us. So the diagnosis of glaucoma is based on a combination of findings. So each individual, they may have a normal visual field, but their pressure might be too high, or their OCT might have a lot of thinning. So it will be discussed with the patient whether or not to stop drops based on those combination of findings on the exam. So if you are diagnosed with glaucoma, what happens next? So there are a few different types of treatments for glaucoma. There's medical treatment, we have laser surgeries that we can do, and we have regular surgeries as well. The first um, line of treatment for all glaucoma patients is to start them on medications. And here is just a sampling of the many different types of medications that are available. Um, there are also combination medications that combine two different classes of medications and put them into one bottle. Um, that's for easier patient compliance and adherence. Um, so there are four main classes of uh, glaucoma drops. These classes include beta blockers, prostaglandin analogs, uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, and that's about it, and any, a few different combinations of those medications. I include this just, I know these are a lot of nonsense words to a bunch of people, but just so you know, there are four main therapies we use to decrease the pressure in the eye. They're eye drops. So you put, you put an eye drop in. It depends on the medication, but you put a drop in anywhere from one time a day to three times a day in the affected eye. We have one question yes. back here. Uh, what about uh, nutritional therapy? I get quite a bit of uh, meal on that, some claiming uh, fantastic results on clinical studies. Um, so there is, so the question was, what types of nutritional therapies exist for glaucoma? Unfortunately, unlike macular degeneration, glaucoma does not have nutritional therapy that um, can decrease the progression of the disease. So. Yes. Um, ran away. Uh, could you explain the difference between high blood pressure and uh, glaucoma pressure? Yes, I'll be happy eye? to. So this is kind of a confusing uh, concept, but blood pressure is not related to glaucoma. And it's hard to explain, but your eye has its own mechanisms for creating fluid. And that fluid is pressure is dependent on two things. One, episclerous venous pressure, which this is all, I know this is confusing, but it's episclerous venous pressure, which is basically the drainage, the resistance to drainage of fluid from the eye. And number two, the rate of production of fluid. So fluid is produced by an active mechanism in a part of your eye called the ciliary body. So they're, they're not related, they're, they're different. I don't know if that, without being too scientific, I, I can keep going if you want to, but, okay. So the, ebby, the ciliary body produces the fluid in the eye at a constant rate, and how well that fluid, some patients may have be hyper fluid producers, while others might be lower fluid producers. And this is still um, a part of science that's under investigation, but they're thinking perhaps some glaucoma patients may be more exuberant producers of the aqueous humor, whereas other patients may have problems with draining the fluid from their eye. And if you have problems with draining the fluid from the eye, it's kind of like a stopped up sink or bathtub. If the fluid can't get out, the fluid is going to continue to build behind it, and that fluid continuing to build behind it is going to cause that high pressure. Is that when they, they laser the eye? The question was, is that when they laser the eye? And I will get to that in just a second. That's a very good question. Yes. Uh, what's the difference between regular surgery and laser surgery? I will get to that as well. That's coming next. Thank you. Thank you. 
The question was, what's the difference between laser surgery and regular surgery? And we have one more question over here. Hello. I'm Mr. Walker. My doctor said I couldn't have laser surgery on uh, glaucoma. You did? Yeah, he said he couldn't. It didn't work. Well, some laser surgeries, it dep every patient's different. So, so some laser surgeries are best for some patients, and other patients have to go straight to regular surgery. Well, I, I, I'm taking Azop eye drops. Oh, Azop's a good one. That good? Yeah, that's good. But it's not, I'm not going blind. It's not doing any better. Well, sometimes you, sometimes if Azop's not doing the job, you have to start with another drop. Yeah, I think so, food, food have a lot to do with it, too. No, food actually does not have anything to do with glaucoma. Food don't, yeah, cheese and eggs and stuff don't do it? No, cheese and eggs don't do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> we have question one more question. over here. Uh, what's the borderline for the eye pressure to be considered normal? So anything less than 21 is normal. But for some patients, if they have really bad glaucoma damage, I like to see their pressure at 8 or 12, so really low. So each person has an individual normal if they have glaucoma. So, but textbook-wise, less than 21 is normal. Question over here. Uh, Yes, I, I was wondering. I know that for glaucoma, there are eye drops that can be used, you know, to take the pressure. But is there uh, something like a, a diuretic for the head area or something, a pill that people could take to lower their pressure as well? That is an excellent question. And yes, there are a few different pills that we can give um, in glaucoma to help lower the pressure in the eye. One of these diuretics is a medication called Diamox, or the other name is acetazolamide. However, I only use that in patients who have un... It's acetazolamide the, the, or Diamox. It's the same medication, they just have two different names. But I only use that in patients whose pressure I can't control with um, drops because it has a lot of systemic side effects. Um, it causes tingling around the, the mouth and in the fingers. It causes things to taste bad. Some patients who can get kidney stones or cause uh, electrolyte imbalances. One question over here. There's a follow-up question and comment. You were saying that uh, nutritional therapy is not effective with glaucoma. No. However, the claims are that it can prevent or, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, for a long time you have, and it is clinical studies record that it is very effective to prevent macular degeneration. So are you challenging the clinical studies? Um, I'm not aware of any studies that are written about nutritional supplements affecting glaucoma. There are studies, numerous studies, about macular degeneration. Unfortunately, and I want to reiterate this, glaucoma is not affected by nutrition, what you eat. how m It is affected a little bit by exercise. Exercise can cause a lowering of pressure in the eye. Marijuana can cause a lowering of pressure in the eye. As we all, I'm sure you've heard. But other nutritional supplements don't cause lower pressure in the eye, and they don't affect glaucoma. Yeah, so, so there, there's that answer. But it does affect macular degeneration. Yes, question, question over here. Yes, is uh, uh, glaucoma uh, hereditary? That is an excellent question, and this is another reason why um, um, nutritional studies aren't as much a role in glaucoma because a lot of patients think, or it is hereditary, and I'll get to that in a minute, too. But if your mom or your sister or your brother has glaucoma, you're at an increased risk of having glaucoma. And they think it's because of the anatomy of your eye makes you more predisposed to developing those optic nerve damages. I have a question over here. And then I'll, I'll, I'll continue with my presentation after that, too. So we'll get to laser like these nice ladies asked about in surgery. 
Is it possible uh, for people that are taking the drops that the color of your eye will change? That is an excellent question, yes. So there are a few different types of categories of drops that I mentioned earlier. And of these drops, you can see these are the four different categories, and they all act by a different mechanism in the eye to reduce the pressure. So this, this group of drugs called prostaglandin analogs, um, they're the first-line treatment for most patients, and they can cause discoloration of the iris itself. However, it doesn't happen in blue-eyed individuals as much or brown-eyed individuals, but in patients with hazel eyes. So green and hazel. So if you have a little bit of brown mixed in with your iris color, it can cause permanent and irreversible darkening of that iris. But I have blue eyes, and blue eyes, I don't have any brown in mine, so I'm, I'm not at as much of a risk as somebody who has some brown and green mixed. So the question was, if you have any of those three colors in your eyes, do you still have a risk? So if you have a mix of any sort of, like, brown in the iris, you do have a risk with the mix. Yeah. So um, back to laser treatments for glaucoma. Um, there are a few different types of laser treatments for glaucoma. And these laser treatments work by helping open up the trabecular meshwork, which helps facilitate drainage through the through the trabecular meshwork. These are relatively low risk uh, procedures, but you do have to have a lens up in your eye and someone trained like an ophthalmologist in this surgery needs to do it. Um, and I often use it when medical treatment fails to reduce pressure enough or when the patient can't comply with the medication, such as the medication causes a lot of eye irritation. So there are three types of laser. Um, the first one is called a laser iridotomy, and that's only used if you have angle closure glaucoma. The next type of laser, and this is the one I do, is called SLT. It's repeatable. So over time, the laser can lose its effect. But the good thing is if you do an SLT on them in 5, 10 years when the laser works off, it's often, you're often able to do it again and get the same effect. The next type of laser is the ALT, and that one is not repeatable. I think we have a question in the back row. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, with uh, uh, the pain in the eye, why? why? That's I've asked my doctor to take the eye out, but he won't but it's very painful at times. That is a good question. So the question is, what causes the pain in the eye? When pressure gets really high in the eye, like in the 40s, some patients can have severe and irretractable pain. And we can only, only help that pain if we can get the pressure lower. So a lot of times when that happens, when the pain's that high, we have to do what's called this laser iridotomy because most of the time, Patients with primary open angle glaucoma don't have eye pain, but the angle closure glaucoma is when you have a lot of pain. So that could be the cause of your pain or it could be something else, but that is a good question. Clo angle closure glaucoma can cause a lot of pain. So now on to surgical treatment uh, for glaucoma. This is a pretty uh, rapidly expanding field at the moment. Um, the traditional therapy for glaucoma is what's called a trabeculectomy. But now we have tube shunts. We have what's called CPC, which is kind of destroys the ciliary body, which produces the fluid. And then the newer surgical treatments are what's called are little devices called the eye stent and the express shunt. So um, the first line treatment that has been around for numerous years is called a trabeculectomy. This is often a, this is performed when medical therapy or laser therapy fails to reduce pressure enough and the patient's still having either too high a pressure or continued visual loss despite aggressive um, therapy. And we basically make another drainage system in the eye to release the fluid and have it drain out another way to lower the pressure even more. As you can see right here, this is called a bleb, and this is the new fluid drainage portion of the eye. Next we have what's called a tube shunt. And there are several different types of tube shunts. But we put this tube into the anterior chamber of the eye. And that tube drains fluid 
back behind the eyeball itself, and that causes a lowering of pressure as well. Um, one of the newer treatments is called an eye stent, and often um, for patients who've had this, this is combined a uh, procedure with cataract surgery. So we put a, a stent in the eye, and here it is up against a penny. See how tiny this is? It's little bitty. And then you go through and put this, this stent in the trabecular meshwork during surgery, and that helps drain the fluid a different way as well. And finally, the last one I want to talk about is called an express mini shunt. And this one is also as tiny as the eye stent. But this one, instead of going from inside the eye, you drain it from outside the eye. So here, here's the surgical instrument putting the um, express shunt in. And here's a picture of it on magnification. So as I mentioned earlier, people with a family history of glaucoma should be screened because you're at an increased risk of having glaucoma itself. And um, does anyone have any questions? I, I had a, a cataract removed on, on uh, one eye, and it, uh, the other eye is total. But uh, after the, 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 the cataract was beautiful, it came beautiful, mm -hmm. but the glaucoma, it just put it into a trauma. And, and now I just, I don't have straight ahead vision. I I just I can see movement. That's all I can see. Cataract that surgery I, can lower can lower uh, the pressure in your eye by about two points on average. However, patients with glaucoma are at an increased risk to of two things after cataract surgery. Sometimes there's a transient pressure spike after cataract surgery itself, and that transient pressure spike in patients with end stage glaucoma can cause even more damage to the optic nerve and more vision loss. The other thing that happens in glaucoma is, uh, after cataract surgery is patients are prescribed a steroid eye drop, and that steroid eye drop can sometimes cause an increase in pressure in the eye. So it can cause worsening of glaucoma, although after the healing process, it normally does cause a reduction in the pressure. Thank you. You're welcome. Say it again, I'm sorry. The stress caused the pressure to increase. N no, that is a good question. It's not like blood pressure. Stress does not cause an, uh, an increase in eye pressure. Okay, um, I just want to know if you have those surgeries, because I already lost eyesight in one of my eyes. Uh -huh. And I know you said wait for those questions for you. That's fine. You so um, I want to know about the, the surgery with the stent stents. I stent, yeah. So not all surgeons do all these um, all these procedures, and it, you'll have to. It depends on the glaucoma specialist you go see. So yeah, they um, want to do that on me. They do want to do it. Yeah, yeah the, but I'm scared because I'm figuring it it won't work. Maybe the scar tissue will grow back and it it'll become the same as it was before. So sometimes um, it's difficult. It's a difficult discussion to have with your doctor. Because, as we all know, oftentimes surgeries work, and they work well. But there's always a risk that the surgery won't work because medicine's still not perfect. We wish it was, but it's not. So it's, it's a tough decision to make. But this is a, this is a good procedure. Um, it's less invasive than the some of the... Stunt. The express shunt, shunt and the eye stunt and stents the eye stunt. Are, good, are good procedures, and they're less invasive than the tube shunt or the trabeculectomy. Or, so, or the laser? Well, not everybody's a candidate for laser. I didn't like the laser. Yeah, yeah. Not everybody's a candidate for laser. It depends on the type of glaucoma, how high your pressure is, what the cause of your glaucoma is, things like that. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. You're Another welcome. question here? What's the question? Oh. What caused a hole to bust directly in the center of your eye, that right in the pupil? A hole bust there and go all the way through your eye, and the fluid runs in the hole out the back. I'm not, so 
the there's a hole in the center of the eye. Sometimes that we make uh, we use a laser to make a hole in the in the posterior now, capsular bag after cataract surgery. Now this hole just came by itself and just burst in there. Hole that. That might be there. that might be a retinal tear, that yeah. or that retinal hole. That's, that's something that's there. actually different than glaucoma. Yeah, right in the center, it's just a hole burst in there, and it ran went all the way through my eyeball. And the doctor said fluid run in the hole from the front and going out the back. That sounds like a, um, a retinal problem. You think it was pressure would cause it? No. Sometimes that just that just happens it sometimes. It's the retina because I can't see directly in front of me. Sounds like, that sounds like a not a glaucoma issue, not a pressure problem. That sounds like a, a retina or a macular issue. Yeah, I, I do have glaucoma, but it happens. Though. And sometimes gla people can have more than one eye disease at a time, Yeah. which is crazy <laughs> and unfortunate. Yeah. We had a question up here real quick, and I'll get to my next patient, of how they put these tubes in the eye. So the tubes in the eye, yeah, so a lot of times we'll do the cataract surgery, and then we have to put a special lens on the eye and get the visual visualization of this angle, and then we go through the hole we made for the cataract surgery and put that same tube, same... Yeah, they implant it, and you probably had a good result, and you probably are happy. You see, we have a happy customer over here. Okay, we have Another a question, question back, back here. here. <laughs> Everybody has two. Is, is possible to have glaucoma only in one eye? Mm -hmm. um, the question is, can you have glaucoma only? Yeah, or? I, yes, I have a glaucoma in, in my right eye. I can see nothing. You can but, see nothing. Yeah, but in the left one, I have I, I, I already had a, a surgery, and now I can see. That's can great. See. Uh -huh. um, so, yes, yeah, sometimes glaucoma, the question is, can you have, what are the causes kind of of glaucoma just in one eye, and is that common? Glaucoma normally affects both eyes, but it can affect both eyes asymmetrically. So one eye can be a lot worse than the other eye. But sometimes if you've been hit in one eye, like trauma, like a, I'm from Arkansas, and there are a lot of BB gun injuries to eyeballs or Nerf gun injuries. And you can be at a risk of glaucoma in the eye that was injured later on down the road. We have a question right here. I had a detached retina surgery. And uh, now my diagnosis is cataracts and sus glaucoma suspect. Now, if I have my cataracts removed, does that affect my glaucoma suspect diagnosis? So the question is, at, um, this lovely lady had a retinal detachment. And after a retinal detachment, she developed a cataract and became, became what's called a glaucoma. Um, our angle recession glaucoma, which is when you were hit in the eye or inflammatory glaucoma. So sometimes patients um, develop inflammation in their eye for a variety of reasons. Some it's idiopathic, which means we don't know why it's caused. Some it's caused by infection. And when that happens, you can develop the secondary glaucoma because it causes scarring closed at the angle. And that we treat a little bit differently than um, primary open angle or primary clo angle closure glaucoma. What was the other part of your question? End-stage glaucoma. So end-stage glaucoma can be any cause of glaucoma. So it can be primary open angle, it can be angle closure, it can be secondary angle glaucoma, and secondary glaucoma. And what happens is that just means you've lost so much vision because the disease is so severe in, in that individual that they only have a small amount of vision remaining. Another yes, ma'am. Another question here. Okay. Please, Doc. I understand that uh, the pressure of the eye causes the optical nerve, nerve to be uh, damaged. If you put the tubular in the eye and the pressure is reduced, does it restore the vision? So the question is, if after glaucoma causes the damage to the nerve, if the pressure is lower, will your vision be restored? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is no, because glaucoma causes damage to the nerve. Nerves, as you all probably may be aware of, 
don't regenerate after they're damaged. So because they don't regenerate, that vision can't ever be brought back. But lower pressure in the eye has been shown to decrease further nerve damage, which translates to prevents further vision loss. Another question here. Uh, my question is, is this. When it is a physical illness, but not related to the eye, you know, like high blood pressure or what have you, there is talk about, you know, watch the diet and try to relax, try to take the stress away and what have you. If you, my question is that if you go along fine, you're taking the meds for glaucoma, everything's fine, and suddenly you get a flare-up over again, can this be caused by uh, any stresses that you may be having in your life? A flare-up of what? A flare-up of the glaucoma with, you know, the horrible pain, the headache. Okay, so the question is, um, this nice lady must have experienced this in the past <laughs> because she knows what's going on. So, so she is questioning whether stress and nutrition can play a role in flare-ups of glaucoma. So for the majority of people in this room, they have primary open-angle glaucoma. And that is something different than this nice lady is talking about. She's experiencing angle closure glaucoma. And angle closure glaucoma, as I mentioned earlier, is when you can get the severe pain in the eye and the headaches and the nausea and the vomiting. It's really a miserable thing to have happen to you if you've ever had it happen. But that's not generally related to stress. It's related to growth of the cataract or some patients, but not mainly Asian patients, can um, develop intermittent attacks. And that's not really related to stress either or other medical ailments. ailments. Oh, okay. So does uh, glaucoma contribute to RP? The question is, does glaucoma contribute to RP, which is retinitis dyspigmentosa? And... No, it does not contribute to RP. Sometimes patients with RP can have glaucoma as well, but the two diseases are different. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question back here? When you have uh, um, pain in the eye, and now I just see it's like a, a very foggy, real foggy, uh, but if, if I am stressed, I don't see anything. So do stress have anything to do with the, uh, the glaucoma? No, stress doesn't have anything to do with glaucoma. I d it, it's kind of, in, you're an exceptional case. I can tell you have, you've had glaucoma probably for a long time and have had to deal with it for yes. um, extensively for probably many, many years. So you're a unique case, and you're not, you're not standard if you will. But I figure if you get stressed and your vision goes out, I'm not sure what's causing that. But you should probably see your doctor and talk to him or her about that. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, this beautiful, shy lady actually wants to know if there's a correlation between diabetes and glaucoma. So the question is, is there a correlation between diabetes and glaucoma? The answer to that is kind of complicated. So some studies say yes, some studies say no, but patients w with diabetes do have a higher incidence of being found that they do have glaucoma. And whether or not diabetes actually causes or contributes to glaucoma damage, we're not sure if there's a correlation there. But diabetics do go to the doctor more often, and they do have to have eye exams more often. So we're not sure if maybe the, they're just being seen and screened for glaucoma more often. Yeah, because I don't have diabetes, but my doctor always keeps asking me if I have diabetes. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there was a correlation. No, there's normally not a correlation between the two. But sometimes diabetes causes other changes in the eye. So maybe he or she is seeing these other changes in the eye. Now, I noticed... Uh, I've been diagnosed with borderline glaucoma in one eye, yes. and ever since they give me the medication, the drops, I've noticed that my eyesight is getting worse. So, and some especially when I'm like on my iPad or on the computer, after a while, I have to like. So sh this lady asked, "Do glaucoma drops ever make your vision worse?" No, the glaucoma drops 
aren't associated with worsening a vision, but sometimes they can dry out your eyes. And dry eyes are especially problematic when you're looking at computers or reading or um, doing tasks that require you to focus more. Because when you focus more, you don't blink. And when you don't blink, your eyes dry out. So one thing that I tell often my patients to do is consider using artificial tears whenever before they start reading or um, working on a computer, and that can kind of help those symptoms. You're welcome. We have another question back here. Yes, ma'am. This is in the interest of holding out hope for the future. Are they doing anything in stem cells where they can regenerate the... The, the uh, optic nerve? Um, not that I know of at the moment, not for glaucoma. They are doing it for macular degeneration, though. And I think as science continues to advance, there's hope, um, especially in hope that maybe there will be a treatment in the future that can restore those nerve cells that have been damaged. Another question? Yes. Uh, what caused the eye itching? <laughs> and what's the reason? So there are lots of different causes. The question is, what causes itchy eyes? So there are lots of different causes for itchy eyes. Sometimes they're allergies. Sometimes it's pollution. Sometimes it's dryness. Um, you can, to relieve that, there are lots of over-the-counter drops that you can buy at CVS, Walgreens, wherever you decide to shop. That can help with that. These medications are Nafcon A, Zatator, or you can just try artificial tears. Oh, we have a question over here. Yes, I know Charles, do you have that? The question is, have you heard of Charles Bonet, um, their illusions? So Charles Bonet, does anybody know what this is? So it's when patients who are blind still see hallucinations, if you will, of like a girl playing in a garden or a truck driving down the street, something that they know isn't there, but they still perceive it. See people often in this mm -hmm. that we have never, never seen in normal life, and, and that—that that is, um, she mentioned that they see people in these hallucinations that they've never seen in normal life, and it's very, a very interesting phenomenon, and it's something that you need to, us as physicians, need to educate our patients on because a lot of times people think they're, they're for lack of a better term, going crazy. But they're not. It's just a normal part of the disease. Yeah. I only started this with after my uh, glaucoma got out of control. Yeah, and that can happen. Mm -hmm. Hello. Unfortunately. I'm from Arkansas, too. Oh, welcome. <laughs> like my fellow Arkansans. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> oh, there's another one. We're all Arkansas. over the place. And right here, too. <laughs> anyway. When my, when my wife stresses me out, uh -huh. my blood pressure goes up, yeah. and I can't see. Well, so, <laughs> Hello. you and your wife need Tell to talk you. about this one. Somebody brought it up before, the pressure, <laughs> your blood pressure goes up, and you can't see. Well, I would tell you this. When your blood pressure goes up, mm -hmm. and you can't see, you probably need to go see a doctor, because I that... Go, I'm going to take, take a pill. <laughs> but your pressure can go up. And you can't see. Well, that that is actually a bad thing. Um, Calm them stress. Yeah, Calm it's them not. Stress. So if your blood pressure is too high, where you lose vision, well, you probably need to go to the emergency room because that can be dangerous it's and cause stroke. It's never over one hundred and twenty. Okay. As long yeah. as it's normal, that's yes. that's okay. But I'd still, if you really can't see and it's that bad, that can be a pre-stroke type I condition. I think it's stress. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but if it's really high, you got to go in and be seen. But it don't get that high. My blood pressure get up to 120. About, that, about it. I don't uh, know. Maybe it's you and your wife. That's nah, a stress. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll know the answer to that one. Uh, another question back here. Okay, another question back here. Some of the medicine that you uh, put in your eyes, can it cause you to uh, have heart problems? So the question is, can some of the medication you put in your eyes call, cause heart problems? Um, so one of the classes of medication we use are the medications called beta blockers. Beta blockers are also used to treat heart disease. 
um, in patients who have heart failure or um, arrhythmias, things of that nature. So they won't necessarily cause heart problems, but in patients who don't have heart disease, they can cause bradycardia, which is slowing of the heart rate, which can be symptomatic. I have a question right here. If you have the swelling of the heart, what is the better medication eye drops for glaucoma? Um, anything but the beta blockers. Any of the prostaglandins, and those are Lumigan, Zalatan, uh, Travitan. Okay. Then there's also, you can use Bramonidine, um, Azopt. Okay. Com there's lots of different ones. So. Now, one other question for you. Now, I heard you mention that marijuana was good for glaucoma. Well, it's, uh, keep going. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's, an, it's an old tale that I've heard many times. Yes. Okay, now I know like for chemo they do like in uh, oral form. Yes. To help with that. Yes. How does it impact glaucoma? So the question, question. is how does, uh, many patients, so I'll rephrase this question a little bit. Um, everyone, a lot of you have heard that marijuana is used for glaucoma. And sometimes patients develop cancer, and there is an oral form of glaucoma or of marijuana that helps stimulate, stimulate patients' appetite and to help them gain weight because patients who are undergoing cancer lose a lot of weight and lose their appetite. So she, her question was, how does the oral pill help glaucoma? And that is an excellent question and one that I don't know the answer to, and I don't think it's been studied. So you may have given me a new idea. <laughs> Study that medication and the effect of pressure. <laughs> and so smoking it, does it really affect the pressure in the eye? So the next question is, does smoking marijuana really um, affect the pressure of the eye? There is, so glaucoma, one of the the problems with glaucoma and patients who develop glaucoma, they found that patients have widely fluctuating pressures and those pressures fluctuate throughout the day. And in the early morning hours, their pressures tend to be really high and at night, they're lower. So glaucoma causes a transient decrease in pressure. However, that decrease in pressure is not long lasting. And there is a problem that it may cause more widespread pressure variations, which may or may not affect the progression of the disease. So while it does lower pressure, its role in treatment of the disease is limited. So. Oh, we have another question over here. Please, Doc, I want to know, why is it that there is nothing like eye plant there is, there is a, a heart transplant, a transplant, there is kidney transplant. Why not eye transplant? That, so the question is, why don't eye transplants exist? And the answer to that question is complicated. So some types of eye transplants do exist, but these are only corneal transplants. So they can transplant the front of the eye to make you be able to see better in patients who have diseases of the cornea, which is the center clear portion of the front portion of your eye. However, eye transplants is a little bit more complicated. And the reason for that is science isn't there yet. So to basically, in a short, short, succinct answer, our, our advances in science haven't advanced that far to enable a nerve from one eye to be reattached to the nerve of a patient's eye. Like nerves, like I mentioned earlier, don't regenerate. And we have to make those two nerves compatible with each other. And that compatibility doesn't exist yet. And partially it doesn't exist because we don't know how to regenerate or regrow nerves that have been lost. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much for uh, having me and I appreciate it. So let's give another round of applause to D Dr. Bachman. Okay, I wanna let you know that if you would like to view 
the video from this seminar, you can go to YouTube and Braille Institute, and you'll be able to see it again. Okay? All right. So now it's very close to the time you've all been waiting for, the drawing for the pebble magnifier. As you know, Braille Institute is a major proponent of the use of technology to stay connected to the world around you. And we'd like to thank our partner, Enhanced Vision, a leading developer of easy-to-use magnification devices for their commitment to accessible technology for people with low vision. So I would like to welcome to the stage Mark Greggett of Enhanced Vision, the sponsor of today's drawing. Hey everybody, I'm Mark with LA Low Vision. How are you today? I see a lot of friends in this room. And what we're going to do is we're going to have Richard McHugh from Center Side. He's going to talk to you for about 15 minutes here. Um, but afterwards, we're going to be giving away one of our new portable devices called the Pebble HD. And a raise of hands. How many people have heard of the Merlin in this room? Okay, we got a few. Um, what we're going to do today, we're actually going to be giving away a Merlin here. So if you stay, uh, the Merlin is, is, is a few dollars. It's about $3,000. So we're going to give it to one lucky person at the end of Richard's sem uh, talk here. So with further ado, here's Richard McHugh from Centrosite. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're approaching that home stretch. We're almost done, and I know everyone's excited for the drawing, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a, an exciting new technology for end-stage AMD patients. Before I talk to you about that, I was standing in the back a little bit earlier looking at all of these wonderful quotes and just thinking to myself how fortunate it is to just be here today and have the opportunity to talk to you and be associated with such a great organization as Braille, Braille Institute. And one particular quote that stuck out to me is the one up here to the left. Braille Institute taught me that I could still enjoy my favorite hobbies, even with low vision. Now, first thought, hobbies, you know, that's it's not a big deal, right? You know, hobbies, we could get by without them. It's not something that we need to do, but it's something that we enjoy doing. And, you know, Braille brings that back, and I'm fortunate that I belong to an organization that also helps our patients regain, uh, hold on one moment, center site, as I talked about a little bit earlier, sorry, I'm going to, there we go, all right, a little bit of technical difficulty there. So center sight is an implantable telescope for end-stage AMD patients. Now, first question is probably telescope in the eye, and we'll get to that soon. But I want to talk to you first about the patients that are suitable for this uh, new treatment because it isn't available to all AMD patients. It's strictly for those patients who have difficulty just doing very basic things uh, throughout their homes, you know, recognizing family members. Now, this is a graphical view of the vision that these patients may have. Uh, and as you can see here, it looks like we have a gentleman with someone on his shoulders, but we can't quite see because of that central vision loss. Uh, and of course, this affects all aspects of this patient's life, their functional vision, their daily living, even social interactions. And you can see how, in this example, how that profoundly reduces their function and, and quality of life. And we, we talk about hobbies. That's something that affects your quality of life. If I didn't have my hobbies, I know that I would be negatively affected, and I'm sure the same would all be for all of you. Now, this implantable telescope, you can see an example of it here. It is very small. It fits into the front of the eye. It's about the size of a pea. And you can see the post-implant here. Uh, you can see the blue. But when you see them in real life, you really cannot see it unless you know what it is that you're looking for. It's very subtle, uh, but it, it does 
provide a return to functional vision for these patients. How it does that, if we look at the left side of the screen here, this is a graphic representation of normal vision, and you can see that the, the vision goes back to the back of the eye onto an area that we call the macula, and this is where your central vision is. And these patients, their macula is affected by this disease, and they can no longer interpret that light being projected into the back of the eye, which causes that blind spot. Through our telescope, which you can see on the right here, it takes that central vision, and it spreads it out over a larger portion of the back of the retina, where we still have healthy retina available. Essentially, we take their vision, which was limited by a uh, central blind spot that took a good portion of their central vision, and that's what my fist is representing here today, and we take this fist and we turn it into a peak. So you can imagine, they're now gonna be able to recognize faces again, they're gonna see the food on their plate, they're gonna get a, a greater ability to read again, watch television, essentially affecting all aspects of their life. Now, we could see this pre-scotoma study or pre-blind spot study for this particular patient just to give you a graphical representation of the improvements that we could achieve. And on the right side, we could see that we, were there, there, we have those blind spots there. Obviously, based on the information that we could see in this image, there is a gentleman there, and it appears that he has a small child on his shoulders. Or at least that's what we hope, because the alternative to that would be really scary, right? Just arms and legs hanging there in the air. Uh, now, with an external telescope, which is an option for these patients, they will get a greater field of view, and it does return some basic vision, but they're still limited because of the, the blind spot that's in place. So you could see some more of this gentleman's face in this example image. Through our device, you get to see the whole face again. And now, in what was originally large enough to obscure uh, this gentleman's face and the child on his shoulders, we now can see that gentleman's face very clearly through this device. On average, we get about three and a half lines of improvement. And that may not make a lot of sense to you uh, because it does get very technical. I don't understand it fully myself. But this best represents the improvements we can make. We, we go from a large blind spot to a small blind spot through this technology. Now, give you another example of how this helps patients. If you think about quality of life, we're talking about self-care, we're talking about activities of daily living, we're talking about recognizing facial expressions. So all those things play a part in that quality of life. Our patients in this graphical representation typically are on some side of the right side of this chart. And through the implant of this device, we get them to the far left side of this chart. We get them above the line, typically, of legal blindness, above 2200. Now, it is unique, this treatment, it is unique in that we bring multiple providers to this. We, Heard from Dr. Davis earlier today. He's with Retina Institute. Um, he's part of one of our teams in the Inland Empire area, and he represents the retina component. We also bring in a cornea surgeon. And we bring in a low vision optometrist, and we bring in a low vision occupational therapist. And it's very unique in that way. There's not many treatments where you bring multiple providers in, and I think it is one of the advantages of this. Um, the program itself, there is an extensive screening process because, again, this isn't available for all end-stage AMD patients or all AMD patients in general. So when we decide to implant this in a, the patient's eye and the patient providers, and they each have different responsibilities for this uh, device in the screening process. And then once the implant is in place, then the low vision team to help the patient learn to utilize this new vision. Because it is gonna be much, much different than what they've experienced in the past, and there is a process involved in it. Now, there are a number of resources available to you. If, if you are interested in finding out more, we do have a table set up in the next room, so after our presentations, I welcome you to come by. Uh, we have brochures. I could also provide you a number where you could uh, call into our center site 
uh, phone support and be connected with a registered nurse. This registered nurse is trained to answer all your questions on the center site program and connect you with local providers if you're interested in learning more and possibly getting into the screening program. Now, I can tell you that this is FDA approved. It is also covered by Medicare. But depending on your current situation with Medicare, whether you have Medigap or HMO, you know, it may be a different financial situations for each of those. But we'll work closely with you to help you understand that, and the providers will also. Uh, but the first step is calling into the center site number uh, to, to begin the screening process. Now, the FDA does have guidelines for this device. And again, it's not available for all AMD patients. It is strictly for end-stage AMD patients with the bilateral blind spots. The patients must be 75 years of age, although we hope to get that expanded in the future. But I'm sorry, what was it? Yeah, yeah it is very, the age is very limiting, um, but that we hope to get that expanded in the future. Also, another limiting factor is that the patient cannot have had cataract surgery in the past. Um, we need to have a, a, a natural lens there to operate. Um, and what's interesting about this technology is that prior to this, there weren't many options for these patients. They often were told that there were little to no options, maybe a vitamin regimen. Um, and, and a lot of these patients would undergo cataract surgery. And the thought was that, you know, it, it was something that could provide a little bit of, of relief, maybe provide a little bit more light, but it didn't address the underlying condition. Now that this technology is available and this treatment is available, we're working hard to get the word out to all of you and all of the providers in the area so that if one of these patients could possibly be a candidate for this, we want to make sure that they don't have cataract surgery before they investigate this because this will address the underlying disease. So uh, we do have a website if you're interested, it's centersite.com, but again, please come by the, the table and I can provide some additional information. But I thank you for your time. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you now. Yes. I, did you say glaucoma? Yes. yes. This is not indicated for glaucoma. It's strictly indicated for AMD. What did you say? What did you say? So you can replace it. Any more questions? I wanted. To, I didn't quite understand your answer. The, it, it's not. This treatment is not indicated or available for glaucoma. This is strictly for AMD patients. Thank you. Yes, age-related macular degeneration. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate your time, and I'd like to invite Mark back up. All right. The moment you've all been waiting for. First things first, please give a round of applause to Braille, Judy, Anita, Rocio, everybody. This seminar happened because of them. They do a fantastic job. And of course, Francis in the back too. I can't forget him. All right. So let's give away the pebble first. Judy, if you would do the honors. All right. Oh, we dropped a few. All right. All right. Abby Gamboa. There she is. A round of applause for Abby. Come on up and grab your pebble here. Now for the, the big one. Who wants to win a Merlin? Did I? What was that again? Who wants to win a Merlin? There you go. All right. Uh, Judy, you can't pick yourself. I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, the winner is Claudia Quintero. Claudia, are you in the room? Quintero. Claudia, going once, going twice. Oh, there she is. 
Round of applause for Claudia, everybody. Very cool. Thank you again for everything. We've got a booth in the back. We have the tech fair over on the side here. Enjoy the day, and thank you for coming. We humbly appreciate it.